Hello and welcome to season four, episode twenty-five of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I am Mark Bishop, and we are as I am uh, amazed that we have gone four seasons in twenty-four episodes. Twenty-five episodes now. Five episodes. Well, this is the twenty-fifth. We've gone through twenty-four episodes. Yes. uh, Of season four, Uh, 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 completely unbelievable. How long did you think this would last when we first started it? I didn't think we'd get through the first season. (laughs) <laughs> really? I thought, yeah i thought you'd just get fed up and quit nope we're still here like over two years into this thing on, <laughs> on season four all right but, but we are of course reading alan ryan's on politics a book describing the history of political theory from herodotus to the modern day and this time we are looking at socialisms so we're again sort of in the modern area era the last quarter of this book where we're just kind of looking more at themes rather than you know piece by piece of history and this time we're looking at sort of modern takes on socialism uh, mostly utopias in this chapter, which I know you love so much and are your your favorite things to talk about. So I'm sure we'll have have some good thoughts from you tonight. There could be nothing less uh, of a, let's see, let's see well, I completely lost my train of thought right in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> uh, there could be uh, nothing more pointless than studying utopias. Hmm. So that is our the introduction to our listener to part of this episode, which is, it is pointless. Yes. Yes, but but I guess we should go ahead and get on into things. Uh, the first section he has in this chapter is titled "The Impossibility of Socialism," um, which you know is a, is a good thing to get out of the way from the start when we're talking about socialisms. Uh, I, he says, I like I like this guy's I like the cut of his jib. Mm. <laughs> I like uh, I like how he acknowledges that uh, this is all nonsense. Yes. Uh, uh, and we'll get into the details in a little bit. But yeah, it seems like a guy that that recognizes re- reality, which is mm-hmm. rare today. I don't know if he could write this book now. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, well, he starts things off kind of talking about the, the 20th century modern world. He says it's pretty much universally agreed that capitalist or liberal democracy is the only way to run a country. Uh, but modern states are expected to ensure the welfare of their citizens in ways that would have unhesitatingly been described as socialist in the past. He says, you know, the, the 18th century, especially if we're looking at a lot of these welfare programs and things like that, those would have been described as socialist. Uh, but he says, you know, we have these extensive social ins- insurance and we have vastly expanded suffrage, but still the dictatorship of the proletariat has never happened. You know, even though we have all of these ingredients that all these socialists were saying, now we'll have the revolution and now we'll have, you know, this, this you know, communist utopia None of that has ever happened. We're just a capitalist system with some minor welfare state. Um, to... Minor. It's, I mean, it's significant, uh, especially, well, if you talk about like uh, capitalist um, economies in Europe, mm-hmm. the tax rates there are, are you know, yeah. Yeah, it leads to that uh, later in the chapter, you know, are pretty confiscatory. Mm-hmm. Um, even, I mean, the tax rates in the United States are pretty bad. I mean, but mostly what we're doing is we're just uh, financing them through uh, excessive amounts of debt, which yeah. we're going to for later. But um, the the uh, and this was written before the big payouts. Uh, oh, here it comes uh, during COVID, um, <laughs> which are just what was that breaking, three minutes this time? It's, it's just breaking the bank. And this not really a reference to COVID. It's just a reference to spending. Uh, although I can go down that pa- tangent if you want. No, no need. <laughs> um, but the the I, I'm wondering what the limit of the welfare system is. Mm. This capitalist, quasi-socialist welfare system, what, is there a limit to it? Um, and some people would say no, you know, and, yeah. and like the AOCs and that kind of stuff about, you know, seizing property and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So it, I think he, he, I think he uh, makes good points in this. I think he, he may be a little bit too optimistic about mm-hmm. the limits of socialism in the present context. True. He does kind of mention, Alan Ryan does, uh, that this chapter explores the utopian socialism, um, and which is different from the pick and mix welfare states that we have. We do get into the welfare state a little bit later. Um, but mm-hmm. as he's mentioning this, we then move into the next section, which is titled Failed Utopias, um, which I think is also very funny when we're talking about the, the socialist utopias. It's um, redundant. It's redundant. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, are there any utopias that have, that, you know, are not failures? Successful yeah. utopias. Is there one? No. They're all failed. They're, they're terrible. Very true. Uh, but he says, almost everyone discussed in this chapter was a failure. All had very different goals that never came to fruition. Uh, and so this kind of leads to the question of what non-Marxian socialists really want. Because that's really who we're focusing on in this chapter, kind of breaking away from the Marxist communism path and seeing what other socialists have come up with. 
Uh, but he says, socialism is always born in revolt against the early industrialization uh, with some precursors in agrarian revolts. We do see some similar ideas in Aristotle's politics and Plato's Republic. And there's a very common antipathy, antipathy to money in most utopias. And, but there has always been an element of nostalgia for a vanished golden age within the socialist ideal. So as much as they talk about progress, there is sort of always this idea that we need to get back to this, you know, agrarian lifestyle. We need to get back to this age of no money, you know, when we're all, you know, no class, no divide, and we're all, you know, living in a commune together, um, which is somewhat hard to reconcile with this idea that progress is the driving factor in that. But those are sort of the two two big points of, of most socialists there. Yeah, I mean, it's a form of nostalgia, you know, mm -hmm. it's a they, they yearn for a day that never existed. Yeah. And, it, you know, I, I have that kind of same tendency. The older you get, the more you're, you're, you're likely to do it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when, when was there a, a system where we didn't have classes or the haves and have nots? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not aware of that era in human history uh, outside of the Garden of Eden. You know, I mean, is there anybody, any other society or culture that has had it? um no that just hasn't existed so it's if if you're saying i want to harken back to the days of yore it's uh, a fool's errand i think yeah very true he then goes on to talk about the varieties of socialism and he says socialism appealed to the first generations of industrial workers who had been swept into the disgusting conditions of industrial towns the new er, working class was angry disoriented and ready to be re uh, to be you know sort of excited into revolution he says, you know, Marx really believed that the developed and self-conscious proletariat would make the socialist revolution happen, uh, but really only the uprooted first generation has been uh, very ready to attempt it. You know, you see a lot of people talking about, you know, how socialism would be so good to implement, but really the only people who have had these socialist revolts are these very low-class people who are kind of swept into this industrial society, and it's a very abrupt change from what they're used to. Everybody else just likes talking about it and not really doing anything to, to progress socialism uh, besides talking about how good it is. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a what's well, a cost benefit analysis, you know, I mean, if back then it made a lot of sense to try mm -hmm. anything else, you know, if you had a leader saying, you know, we need to divide this up among us and, and uh, spread the wealth. And it made a lot of sense because they had just lived in terrible conditions yeah. and there was such abject poverty right next door to tremendous wealth. And, and it, it called to a lot of people and I probably would have been a socialist back then yeah. I mean, it, because it, it wasn't working the way the way the system was set up. Mm -hmm. And you, I think we're going to see more of, of that, oddly enough, in, in the near future, because of this huge um, gulf between the, the wealthy and the, and the poor, the super yeah. wealthy. And um, but but once it's been tried a couple of times and, 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 I, and I know I'm critical. Well, I mean, there's still these weirdos that don't know anything that talk about communism and they wear a hammer and sickle but nobody takes them seriously because mm -hmm. they're fools and it's yeah. been tried and and we all know you know you know people will fight over welfare and benefits and this and that kind of stuff and but but when it comes down to it nobody really wants a revolution yeah if you read anything about revolutions uh, mm -hmm. because they're just it's just carnage. Yeah. Well, well, to your point, you know, Alan Ryan also does say that the outrage against early industry was not felt only by the socialists. You have these two people, Thomas Carlyle and John Ruskin, for example, who were very big opponents of the Victorian laissez-faire approach, and were admirers of cohesive societies, and were very disdainful of money making, and were preachers of the gospel of work. Uh, but Carlyle admired Frederick the Great of Russia, and Ruskin described himself as a Tory. Uh, and the ideas of both were both very hierarchical and backwards looking, not favoring progress as the key to emancipation, but looking at it with fear. So you do still have, I think, kind of the people that you would fall into their camp, you know, looking at these terrible conditions, but not also saying we need to progress this industrial society to the extent that we were revolting and making, you know, this this grand, you know, communist empire or right. commune, I suppose. Yes. Where we don't have any sort of government. I mean, yes. it, it was nonsense on stilts that even back then. And so you'd have other people reformers, but, but when you, you know, but my, my sympathy would be, you got throughout this system, if it, it was so corrupt and, and, and there was no other way out of it, mm -hmm. you know, and some sort of armed rebellion or yeah. reaction at the time. I mean, that's the way it would be perceived if you're in this, you know, if, you, if you're working 12, 14 hours a day, mm -hmm. days a week in a, in a factory with terrible conditions and your kids there next to you, I mean, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, uh, if that's not a recipe for a revolution, I don't know what is. <laughs> no, really, you got no hope. You got Very nothing. True. 
And what does your what does your son have? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, the, the his future is what you're living. Screw it, you risk his life too. Yeah. You know, there's an off chance of of getting a better deal for the kid. Mm -hmm. you know, you take a bullet, or maybe even you know some of your kids dying because yeah. the other one maybe you have some sort of life worth living. Mm -hmm. Well, that was more of Marx's point. Uh, Ryan kind of mentions that he viewed any socialist who thought that the people could be argued into creating a better society by moral exhortation and not with violence. Uh, he, he viewed those people as the utopian socialists. That's really who we're kind of looking at here, those who weren't in favor of violent revolution. And he thought that we all need, uh, you know, uh, the, these socialists thought that we all need work and to be rewarded fairly to our usefulness. usefulness uh, and this is what unites all socialists, this idea of, of work and getting proper compensation, you know, for what we need. That is sort of the socialist ideal in a that, nutshell. That is according to this author. Yes, yes. <laughs> socialists are like, just give me free stuff. Yeah. You know? Why can't the government give me free this and give it? Well, because it's not really the government. It's, it's all mm -hmm. your you knucklehead. Get to work. <laughs> it wants to work nowadays. You know, that's, that's a refrain. This is an old man grump talk. Mm-hmm. A refrain I hear from every person who is either a manager, employer, small business owner, or somebody that does any hiring, and the refrain is the same. People do not want to work, and it yeah. is bizarre. I mean, it's, it's really, really kind of scary mm -hmm. um, because the system doesn't work if people aren't willing to do at least some amount of work. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, but the, you know, the, um, you know, Marx, of course, was a nut. <laughs> uh, these other these other guys, you know, had had interesting thoughts about how do we do socialism if we're not going to have this, you know, uh, you go through these these steps and then poof, everything's good. Mm -hmm. you know, they're they're trying to think through, okay, well, how do we how do we do a socialist system that's different from a capitalist economic system mm -hmm. where we have to rely on poof, we we're all you know holding yeah. hands singing songs yeah i do admire these utopian or you know i have greater respect i guess for these utopian socialists rather than marx because at least they're not arguing we're going to kill everybody in power we're going to put ourselves in power and then we're just going to magically turn into communism at least these guys even though their plans were absolutely crazy and kind of you know fantastical it was right. better than that um okay. so i think we can give them a little bit of credit yes uh, but then he talks about the politics and anti-politics of socialism, of course, making the very good point that how a socialist state will be achieved and governed has no agreed upon answer. Uh, but almost all socialists have disliked the state. And the underlying theory behind this is that the state exists because there are conflicting and common interests. There are deep conflicts of interest over outcomes. The rich wish to enslave the poor and the poor want to expropriate the rich. However, the different classes do share many interests, but the modern state uh, you know, does nothing but uh, is nothing but a managing committee for the interests of the bourgeoisie. So essentially, the uh, the state is not looking for those commonalities; they're just looking to prop up the upper class. It says without the state, the rich would be at the mercy of the poor. In the practice, the law defends the have a lots against the have very littles. And reform cannot happen until power is given to the less fortunate members of society. He says, you know, the tax system may be used to achieve more equality, but socialists often think that this is only a halfway step. You know, we have to go beyond just taxing the rich and then we have to move into something else to really give the power back to the poor people and, you know, ultimately do away with the state, uh, which really just serves the rich. Mm. And that, that is a good summary of their views. And, uh, and of course, it's complete nonsense. Uh, yeah. BS, I want to say, because, you know, the poor need the poor need the government more than the rich do mm -hmm. you know, the, the the rich can privately fund a security system <laughs> in a way uh, to protect them from the poor and a lot of and over history that they, they did like if you look at like um when there were really big problems with monopolies and was in the 1930s um mm -hmm. 20s and 30s we had anti-competitive monopolies those guys had their own like they had railroad police yeah. and they st actually they still do which i think i mentioned in a previous podcast in missouri law that, that there are they have their own police departments hmm. they arrest anybody for crimes committed on railroad property, which is usually just the tracks, but they also have, anyway, I digress, uh, but they, <laughs> they, they, they're funded uh, by the railroad companies. So they're, they're paid for by them, but they have a power of arrest, a limited power of arrest. And they, they had those, they were, they were a railroad detectives uh, that were uh, known as skull crushers back uh, with the hobos back during hmm. the depression. They would ride up and down the, 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 because the hobos would travel from place to place because they didn't have any work and they didn't have any, you know, there's, there's no opportunities and, you know, might as well ride the rails to see what's the next town's going to, because they're going to feed you. And they'd have railroad cops, railroad detectives that would, if they caught you, they'd beat you up, throw you off the train. Yeah. 
literally toss them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so, you know, but, but today in the modern age, you know, you know, who needs the, the government are the, uh, the poor people, mm-hmm. you know, the people that, that are not of means to, to protect them and their, yeah. their communities and, and, um, to, to keep them safe and to provide services. Yeah. I, I think the, the socialist thinking is really just like a numbers game. You know, you have so many more poor people than you do the rich. And the only thing stopping the poor people from, you know, coming up and, you know, rising up and insurgents and killing all of the rich people is the state. When in reality, I, I don't think that's true. I think, you know, yeah, it, the other poor people, they yeah. always form factions. They start murdering each other. Every <laughs> time. Yeah, it's a whole joke, you know, mm-hmm. like the old Monty Python thing. Uh, we're the Palestinian Liberation Army. And, uh, you know, we, we hate the, the old Palestinian Liberation Army. I remember <laughs> what the term was, you know, we hate them more than we hate the Romans. Uh, and and that's always been the case Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's and of course you know the the argument from marxists or socialists are that some of them will be some poor people will be in the pocket of the 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 wealthy and the 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 rich and and so then they they're working against their own interests they don't realize it that kind of stuff but um but i mean there's there's competitive Mm -hmm. interests in, in all throughout society in all economic strata true we then get into the first few utopian socialists, uh, and he says, Modern socialism begins with the trio of Robert Owen, Henry de Saint-Simon, who we talked about in a previous episode, and Charles Fourier. Now, Owen was the first British socialist. He was born in 1771 and became a shop assistant at the age of nine, and went on to become a part owner of a cotton mill in New Lamarck in Scotland. And his one idea was that human nature is infinitely malleable, and anyone might be given any character through their upbringing. So he advocated for a society with a benevolent force exercising total control over inhabitants. And so he created this community. I'm going to read from the book here on page 867. Uh, In fact, it led him to the creation of a community where his mill workers lived in decent cottages with good sanitation and gardens in which to grow fresh food. And when they were at work, experienced a simple monitoring system that consisted of a triangular piece of wood painted different colors on its three faces to indicate the quality of work they were doing. Owen's emphasis was on character rather than on belief or intellectual training. Different people had different inclinations, their natural bent, and different degrees of intellectual capacity. It was the creation of cooperative, dutiful, public-spirited characters that he aimed at. And so this mill became very successful and made Owen somewhat famous, and so he began considering political and intellectual ambitions. And he became increasingly distasteful for Christianity, uh, because of course he did, um, as its insistence on original sin and uh, divine rewards and penalties really conflicted with his idea of infinite malleability of the human character. Right. He, 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 he kind of viewed, uh, it's, it appears to me, he viewed humans like dogs mm-hmm. uh, that you can, if you, you give them positive and negative rewards as they're growing up, then you can train them to do certain things and they'll either be happy or sad. Of course, dogs are even better than that. I mean, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's the, the, the foundation of his theory is, is, is the uh, uh, thing that is least workable of the mm-hmm. entire thing that uh, somehow you know there is not um some sort of consistent basis of human nature across time mm-hmm. that's he, his view is that uh if you just change the environment uh, you're going to get a different type of human mm-hmm. uh and that just is not true very true i was actually talking about this the other day with some people um in regards to like the penal system and things like that because I feel like his approach is now like the common belief of just about like everybody uh, or most people in regards to the penal system kind of favoring the the rehabilitation over like any sort of punishment or, or safety factor uh, of, of the penal system kind of thinking that, well, we just need to, to rehab these people and they will come out and they'll be good people and they will work hard and things like that. And we were talking, it's like, well, that's just not true in every circumstance. Sometimes people are just evil and part of the penal system. But one of the, the parts I know we've talked about this before in the podcast, but one of the parts of the penal system is to just punish people for their crimes. If they have done the bad thing, they get the punishment, and that is how it works, also deterrence and things like that. Um, right. But I think a lot of people are really just really trying to hammer hard that this this idea that rehabilitation will solve all of our problems. As long as we fix the environment that they're in, nothing bad will ever happen. Um, but I just think that's not true and has been proven untrue time and time again. Yeah, and, and I think, well, and of course, the response from somebody who believes in it will just say we haven't done the re, the uh, rehabilitation right. But there is some mm-hmm. a lot of truth to that. Yeah, because we have this theory that we can we, we should use it, use the penal system as a rehabilitation system, a social services agency. But we don't even we don't study it. You know, we, we don't look, OK, what actually works mm-hmm. Get these guys and it's pretty, pri- primarily men. 
uh, on the straight and narrow. So they get out of here and, and they don't commit crimes. But the, I mean, I don't want to go to, this is kind of a side discussion, but so many times, you know, I, I believe everybody can be redeemed. I, mm-hmm. I believe that, but I also understand statistics and, and just what the reality of life is some people, there's going to be, you're not going to be able to save everybody um, no matter how hard you try. And so it's just a matter of, uh, of, planning you know governmental planning there's a lot of people that are just so damaged in their youth and their upbringing and their lack of a father et cetera et cetera et cetera mm-hmm. that they're just never going to turn that corner yeah and they just choose not to anyway but but so we do everything wrong so we, we have this emphasis on rehabilitation but then we don't do anything to rehabilitate mm-hmm. people and rehabilitation means you have to that people have to acknowledge that they're wrong mm-hmm. you know that the, the criminals are wrong and, and you have to drill that into them and in and, and all contexts that they are there because of them and that they did bad things and they have been bad people. Mm-hmm. Generally. I mean, I don't I mean to overstate it. We're all human. We all have a certain value and all that kind of stuff. But we don't even do that. Yeah. You, know, because you can't rehabilitate somebody if they don't think they did anything wrong. What, are they, what, are they, what would they be rehabilitated from? Mm-hmm. They're all great people. You know, they're all everybody's a yeah. nice well because it's they're their own story and, and that's true of all criminals too yeah. and, and then we don't have any punishments so and and then on top of everything else everything is delayed mm-hmm. our system is so corrupted by delays that the distance the time distance between crime and punishment or rehabilitation is too lengthy for it to have any meaningful relationship between one and the other mm-hmm. uh, we need to speed things up and we need to have expedited and shorter in my opinion, shorter prison sentences and jail sentences, but more close to the trial yeah. or to, to the crime. Um, because otherwise it's just like people just get a, because what happens is they get slap on the wrist, slap on the wrist, slap on the wrist over a period of four years. And then bam, they've got three five prior felonies and they do something else and they're in prison, you mm-hmm. know, and they, they've never been in prison before. They've been in jail before, except for 24 hour hold. Yeah. And anyway, so that's a whole different discussion. But you're you're right to 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 key in on the on the on the right issue mm-hmm. that um, you know you, you 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 can't you can't fix people uh, just through some social science. Mm-hmm. It's got more out morality element to it, and and uh, mm-hmm. it's not all just social work and uh, rainbows and and ponies. Yeah, because I do agree that like your upbringing and a lot of you know your circumstances, you know, growing up and stuff like that can have an impact on you know the likelihood of crime and you know poverty rate and stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, that's it's it's a lot of people focus too much on that and ignore that the person still did the crime. Society at large did not commit the crime on behalf of that person, if that makes sense. Because I think a lot of people are like, well, they were just raised incorrectly and it's not their fault. If you do the crime, it is still your fault, even if there are explaining factors to it. And we should try to fix those explaining factors, of course. But we not, must recognize that, yeah, that person still did the crime. And, you know, there is a punishment for that. It is a weird discussion when you really look at it. Uh, because you you can you can look you can you we know what what increased crime rates uh, what what causes those mm-hmm. oddly enough, we know single parent households um, are, are really is the big thing mm-hmm. right single mothers if you're born if if, uh, if you're especially if you're a guy if if your uh, dad abandons you and you're raised by a single mother you have a he- much I mean it's just, just huge disparity between that person's chance of, of going to prison or being involved in the criminal justice system versus somebody who comes from a, a stable two-parent male and female married uh, household uh, is just unbelievable, uh, mm-hmm. the difference. Uh, just that one factor. Now, a lot of things go into that, uh, uh, how you end up with a stable marriage. Mm-hmm. But, but, there, but it's, it's kind of wild to think about how predictive it is while at the same time understanding that the individual involved is making individual decisions and is morally responsible for them. Mm-hmm. It, 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 so there's that tension there. Okay, what, what part of it is society and what part of it is the individual? Yeah. And the answer is yes. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's because when you look at every, and I wish we would, we would do more of that where, where like if you, and it takes time and it's effort and it's brave, but what like maybe in this next, political uh, run for president we could have a candidate and when they say 
well, I, I need a help, a helping hand because I, I was this and that. And I wish a politician would say, okay, let's talk about your situation. How far did you go in school? Why did you drop out? What, you know, did you, did you do drugs? Did you have premarital sex? Did you have all the, you know, all these risk factors that almost guaranteed all those decisions that person made for, for so many years, almost guaranteed the outcome they ended up getting. Mm -hmm. Um, but they keep making those bad choices. At some point, it, there, there has to be an acknowledgement that we used to have in, in American society that you're supposed to work hard and, and um, you know, mind your, your P's and Q's, not hurt people and, and uh, not steal stuff. Uh, and, if you, and if you ran out on your kids, you were, you were shunned. Mm -hmm. you know, now it's like, I don't, or if you cheated on your wife, you were shunned. Now it's like nobody cares. It's yeah. just it's far. Um, I have no use for those people, uh, but I'm, a, I think a distinct minority, but yeah. if you'll, you, if you notice, generally my friends are married people, you know, they've been married hmm. for a while. Um, and part of it's just the, the way things go because I'm married. And so if you're going to be going out, you go out with other married people yeah. generally not my age, but, um, but you know, if, if you have a bunch of friends that cheat on their wives, pretty soon you're going to cheat on your wife. I mean, it's yeah. just, but it's still the person's choice. You know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. like, it's yeah. a weird dynamic. Yeah. Well, it's good to say, cause it's not, you know, a hundred percent of people in single parent households don't go on to commit crimes. You know, it's a higher percentage, but it's still, you know, you can choose not to commit those crimes. Like it's still a decision. Even if you do have, if you are part of the group where it's a higher percentage. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just kind of an interesting um, uh, discussion of personal responsibility versus uh, society's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Society has, I think we have a responsibility to these kids. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's such a tragedy that we're doing absolutely nothing mm -hmm. um, to improve the situation for these kids in, yeah. in high crime neighborhoods. It, it's like we just don't care and we're just letting it happen. But, you yeah. know, the only way to do anything about it is to go in there and say, hey, um, maybe you shouldn't um, be, you know, impregnating five different women. <laughs> you dirty, <laughs> filthy punk. Uh, <laughs> Maybe maybe we should go back to the the um, the old days where they, the adulterers uh, would have the scarlet letter. I mean, mm. that, let's let's brand these guys and put yeah. something on the forehead. Well, we were just talking before the podcast. Like this isn't a new issue. I was mentioning this album that I have, the the Save the Children soundtrack from Motown, which I mean I'm sure did a you know a whole lot of good. You know, sarcastically, it was it was about as a uh, a concert live concert, but it was all about you know we need to stop the drug problem that's predominantly going on in, in black communities and stuff like that. So this is something that people have been like raising awareness for, you know, for decades now. And we just haven't really done anything about it. What year did that come out? 73, I believe early seventies for sure. Seven, the early seventies are idyllic compared to what yeah. they are for the Afro African American community. It, you know, it's just, it's just horrible. Um, and it's a real tragedy you know, my thoughts on the abortion issue were that they would view, the, the people in the future will, will view the United States uh, up until well, now, they still, several states are, are encouraging it, but we're starting to see a transition away from abortion. I, I think that people 100 years from now will look at us like, uh, you know, the, the people that allowed the Holocaust to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and I think 100 years from now, people will wonder, why did we allow all this, all this murder and and depravity to exist in our in some of our communities and we're not doing anything about it but yeah. the, what we have to do is we'd have to take the heat which is you guys are acting like jackasses and you're going to stop and um, and who has the courage and, and we have a, a majority of white people so in this in this this country 65 percent, i think still mm -hmm. and it takes us to say nope you're doing it wrong and 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 you're gonna be called racist you know and that's i think until we have uh, a solid majority of white people that are willing to be called racist by telling the black people as a group, not even individuals, but you know, there's a lot of you guys are screwing it up and, uh, and you know, there's a lot of white people screwed up too. And you can see their out of wedlock childbirth rates are starting to become equal. Yeah. Um, it's destroying the entire society. And uh, anyway, so it's, that's a, different, a whole different rant. Yes. I don't know how we get on that. But we're talking yes. about utopias. I'm yeah. talking about a utopia too. When we, and, and and having said all this, I, I I am not a fan of utopias, but I do believe uh, that society could exist with no crime. You know, it's like it's like Bill Cosby's theory about um, out of uh, about out of uh, out of wedlock childbirth. 
the entire problem could be solved in nine months. And they're, how'd hmm. that happen? Well, you just marry the woman you just impregnated. You know, it's <laughs> problem solved. Uh, nine months, no more illegitimate births. Um, of course, the uh, Planned Parenthood would have to say, we'll just kill them all. Yeah. Uh, hmm. problem solved. Um, but um, but I, 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 don't, I don't think we have to have crime, but we do. Yeah. We do have it. Anyway, so I'm a utopian at heart. Yes. To get back to, to Robert Owen's utopia, uh, he began looking for a way to uh, to kind of cure British unemployment. He proposed the creation of model villages where the unemployed cultivated their own food and became self-supporting. He also imagined a system of labor exchange where everybody would get a receipt for their labor and use it to secure what they needed through exchange of these labor tickets. The thought behind this was that the work is inevitable and can be satisfying. Uh, but overall, Owen was committed to a no, to nonviolence and uh, moral coaching, which was very different from other socialists. So give him some credit. He wasn't advocating for kill all of the people in charge. Uh, but his idea of these labor tickets is still just kind of weird and out there. Yeah, he's assuming that everybody's going to want to work. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and you know, growing your own food is hard work. <laughs> but back then, I mean, they, they all, everybody worked hard. Yeah. You know, every, every occupation was tough. before. That is true. All that. Then moving on to to Charles Fourier, who was born in 1772 and died in 1837, uh, he spent much of his life uh, waiting in a cafe, hoping for someone to invest in his phalansteries, uh, which we'll get to in a minute, but uh, very good guy, really, really hardworking there. Uh, his theory was set out in uh, his 1808 book, The Theory of the Four Movements, and he thought that traditional morality cut against the grain of human nature and was at odds with our deepest needs. Since duty was a human invention and morality should be a system of self-restraint, to limit uh, the war between one person's satisfaction and another's. So the remedy was establishing associations large enough to satisfy all of our emotions. And at that point, our passions would become cohesive centripetal forces. These associations were those phalansteries, and they would contain exactly 1,620 adults, a man and a woman for each of the 810 distinct kinds of temperaments that he discovered. Uh, but he did not give an exact account of how this would create harmony um, he essentially just came up with like a personality test and was like, these are all the temperaments. These are all the people who need to be in this community and everything will be great because of that. Um, but parts of his ideas were seized by other thinkers. I'm going to read here on page 890. Uh, they ignored Furrier's claim that the sea would turn into lemonade. Six moons would rotate around the earth. Lions become vegetarian and more in the same vein. They seized on one central idea. This was his notion of travail attractif. Uh, which is this idea of, you know, work being essentially the same thing as play, just very, very enjoyable work. Um, and so he says, you know, the, there's also a way to mitigate the issues with that idea, um, because, you know, well, work's going to get tiring after a while. But his idea was this idea that we all have a passion for papillonage, which is a desire for variety. And so his idea was that nobody should uh, perform any task for more than an hour and a half to two hours, and that the 14 hour day is an affront to human nature. Um, and despite all this craziness, he did have avowed followers influence, influencing people into the 1960s, and many responded well to the idea that work could be done in moderation as a form of self-expression. So that was Charles Fourier's uh, ideas there, really, really out there. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I so, don't have any thoughts on on this gentleman. I have, I have zero thoughts. You have zero thoughts. I don't have anything worthwhile to say about him. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of just, you know, pretty self-evident of how ridiculous it is uh, up to the fact that he was just waiting in cafes for someone to walk in and invest in his ridiculous idea of these people with these temperaments and just be like, yeah, this is great, guys. Let's pour tons of money into this idea. But All right, I have a thought. I have a thought. OK, he, he categorizes 810 distinct kinds of temperament. Mm -hmm. He thinks that it's a good idea to have all of them. In each one of these little utopias, well, really, if you're going to have a utopia, you want the same type of temperament. Mm -hmm. I think you want a unanimity rather than a disparity. Um, now he, I guess he would say, well, they temper each other. Uh, yeah. I don't know. But, well, you know, surely, that's... you know, at least some of those temperaments are evil. If these are all of the possible temperaments for people, you know, there's going to be people like Hitler. I don't. I don't think you. I don't think you want one Hitler in every single commune. I feel like that's that's kind of the opposite of a utopia. Yeah, Hitler was pretty rare, uh, mm -hmm. but certainly there's going to be aggressive yeah. people. And I mean, if you're an aggressive man, are you going to marry an aggressive woman, or would you have a docile? I mean, how do you, how do mm -hmm. you match them up? They don't. It, it, you know, opposites attract. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it was. Uh, it's kind of weird because, like, yeah. you know, the most successful. Uh, or um, agreeable societies, I guess you'd say, are the ones that are very um, 
um, are not very divorce diverse. Yeah. We'll say, if you follow. Uh, we then move on to John Stuart Mill, who was interestingly uh, a very unlikely follower of Fourier. He believed yeah. that socialism of some shape is necessary for the developing capacity of the working classes for free and equal citizenship. Uh, and he says socialism could be achieved in Britain in piecemeal fashion, but there was a great deal that could be done to reform the present system of private ownership. So simple majority rule is the bad basis for modern politics, but self-government in the workplace will help create an intelligent electorate. As mankind is capable of self-sacrifice and cooperation for violent and destructive action and war, uh, but more enlightened humanity could bring the same moral commitment to production. And it was an affront to human dignity to always be in the position of taking orders and never be in the position of deciding one's fate by free and rational discussion. So it's very important for workers to have more say for the betterment of society as a whole. So kind of this idea of building on four years idea that, you know, all of our you know work is enjoyable and this idea that we're all kind of living together and, and able to you know, kind of navigate our place in the workplace and stuff like that. That's really what John Stuart Mill was 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 drawing from, not this idea that we need to build these wacky, you know, communes of 1620 people. Uh, but this idea that, you know, if we do have more say in the work and our work is enjoyable, then we can build a, a better society. And I think that's true enough. True. I mean, it makes a good point, but but when he's talking about like um, you're basically a slave if your job is just taking orders from other people, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of people, especially with work, they don't want to be managers. You mm -hmm. know, they don't want to be taking orders. They just want to do the work, uh, and 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 they just want to, you know, it's not necessarily like being told what to do. But if you know your boss is polite about it and just kind of gives you direction and okay, which which part of the job. Are, like if you're you're laying concrete, you know, okay, mm -hmm. which which side of the road are we gonna start on? We're gonna start here and go that way. Well, <clears throat> that's not terrible, you know. And if mm -hmm. and if you, if you enjoy your work and you're doing well at it and it supports you, uh, it's not an affront to human dignity to always be the one taking the orders. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to do it. And, and you know, he mentions and as you mentioned, I think when we we're in the early discussion of Mill, where he talks about a well-paid slave is is a slave. That, I think that, that it disregards the definition of slave. Yeah. You know, a slave doesn't get paid. Um, it, 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 what he really is probably talking about is a prisoner of sorts. And, and you know, a prisoner can be paid, but you're still locked in the cage uh, of some fashion. Mm -hmm. But it just seems to me it's overstated. Um, yeah. You know, and I think for somebody like Mill, who is very smart and, and very much in, into uh, being a libertarian, and then individual freedom just is 100% what is valued by everybody. It's just not true. Most, most people don't want complete and total freedom. Yeah. Because that's complete and total responsibility. It's mm -hmm. scary, you know? And um, anyway. Yeah. Very true. We then move into a very fun discussion of, of anarchism. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, that's a winning strategy. Uh, it says pure state hatred is the essence of the anarchist strain in socialism. Uh, because the state exists to protect the rich, we must just get rid of the state entirely, of course. Uh, and Michael Bukhanin, uh, Bakunin was the most prominent modern anarchist. He was a Russian aristocrat uh, born in 1814. They're always aristocrats. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Uh, every, he... every revolutionary was a rich person, usually a, a trained philosopher. <laughs> <They're all murderers. laughs> Uh, but he rebelled against the stifling piety and brutality of the uh, Tsarist regime under Nicholas I. He believed that the revolutionary must destroy the state at once to liberate the energies that will create a new society. He is best remembered for the aphorism, Destruct destruction is also a creative act. And he was very unflinching about destroying the old order, and so spent many years in jail and eventually died in 1876. But he was very influenced by Proudhon's mutualist ethics. He thought that what we need is justice, and justice is tied to fair exchange. Uh, and he has a good little quote here on page 896 about Bakunin's talent. Uh, he says, in any event, Bak Bakunin's talent was not for analytical work of the sort that Marx excelled at. It was for unmasking every last sign of authoritarianism and encouraging the spirit of revolt in the working class, for whose allegiance he and Marx, along with many others, were competing. One tribute to his persuasiveness as an insurrectionist was that Marx moved the headquarters of the First International from London to the Hague and then to New York to frustrate the attempts of Bakunin's followers to gain control of it. So this dude was just so unrelentless. Uh, just go in there and, and take control of this other Marxist regime because uh, they're wrong and I'm right and we need this anarchism. So he had to move this headquarters three times, which I think is very funny. Anybody who, who inconveniences Karl Marx, I think uh, I have a little sympathy for. 
and I don't know if, if an anarchist took over an organization, would they just dissolve it? I guess I don't know. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, and I thought I was uh, fascinated that he had, you know, his his quote of destruction is is also a creative act is is very similar to uh, capitalists who view um, uh, talk about creative destruction, mm-hmm. uh, like one industry or you know one the the newer product um, destroying the the old inefficient way things are being done, and of course you know that that a corporation or that business may go under uh but you have a more efficient more effective yeah. way to do something and, and so you have creative destruction which is really the two sides of the same coin yeah. i guess it's also very similar to hinduism if you remember all the way back two seasons ago when we were talking about the the hindu gods and shiva the destroyer yeah. is one of the the three major gods in hinduism and he is of course the destroyer but his whole point is he has to you have to destroy something in order for something new to come out of it so very similar philosophies between Shiva and the anarchist Michael Bakunin. And also similar to Gandalf the Grey turning into Gandalf the White. Very, very we true. We were not cast uh, into the pits with the Balrog, mm. not have uh, come to transition into Gandalf the White, which ended up being a major uh, way to defeat the evil Sauron. Very true. So Gandalf, Shiva, and Michael Bakunin, all in the same camp here, to to some degree. (laughs) Um, But the best known successor of Bakunin was Peter Kropotkin, uh, who was known as the Anarchist Prince. Uh, And he began his political education as a member of the Corps of Pages to Tsar Alexander III, and spent much of his life in exile in Western Europe, and he gave an intellectual substance to Bakunin. But he was not a pacifist. Uh, he believed that violence against state authority was justified in self-defense against repression of all reformist ideas. But outside this, violence is self-defeating. So he's, he, you know, he advocates for some amount of violence towards the government if it's attacking you. But other than that, if you're using violence, it'll defeat yourself. Uh, but he also demolished the pretensions of social Darwinism. This Darwinism really reveals the naturalness of cooperation and mutual assistance throughout the animal kingdom. And so aggression and competition would wither away once mankind took control of its own life and lived in natural cooperation. Uh, And to that, I say, have you ever seen an animal? Like, they fight over everything more than any human has ever done. I don't know where he's getting this idea of of mutual cooperation is very inherent to to most animals. I I guess he's, like, only paying attention to certain insects. You know, like ants, but even they go to war with each other. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have ants, I think, actually are the most, uh, you know, war-oriented animals, even including us. Like, there are ant wars between different types of ants. It's crazy to watch. If you've ever seen videos, like, they will throw people at each other like it's an actual, like, human battle. It's crazy. Right. right. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what animals he's looking at that just naturally cooperate with one another. Like, I know you have wolf packs and lion packs and stuff like that, but even outside of the pack, they, they will fight other lions. Yeah. Or and even within have- the pack, they're competing for food. Or from the alpha, the head head of the uh, the pack itself. So maybe yeah. he's just maybe he's a big fan of sheep, <laughs> you know, because that's really what. No, they cooperate. They eat the grass and they move together like a flock of birds. That's, that's the only reasonable explanation. <laughs> Get along really well, and uh, you know those cows are pretty cool too. I guess. <laughs> what if he's a shepherd? Maybe, maybe. Uh, we then move on to Bellamy and Morris. Uh, he says there's a strain in socialist theory that emphasized centralized economic control. This is one instance of this is one of the least likable utopias ever written. Uh, Edward <laughs> Bellamy's Looking Backwards, written in, 18, uh, in 1887. Uh, and he has a quote here. Uh, Bellamy was a Massachusetts journalist who in the early 1880s was deeply depressed by the horrors of industrial life in New England, both by the conditions of work and by the social and economic inequality of the new industrial system. He opens looking backward by comparing 19th century America to an overcrowded coach being hauled over a rutted and dangerous road, not by horses, but by men. People would fall off the coach and be set to pulling the remaining passengers on their way. A few would scramble back on and displace others. Those on board were terrified of falling off, and those below were exhausted, dispirited, and angry. Uh, Mm -hmm. So a critique uh, and sort of a metaphor of the capitalist system there. Kind of sounds like uh, something from... um the odyssey or something mm. like this, you know this this coach that's going along and or like you know the titans that one guy has to hold up the earth forever or whatever or the, the one Atlas. guy but one guy pushing the the boulder up the hill oh is that sisyphus yeah. i want to say that's sisyphus but i could be wrong yeah one of those so that's, that's what kind of reminded me of like some sort of ancient you know greek story of the the uh, the never-ending coach from hell you know yeah <laughs> 
bumped off and then jumping back on and bumping somebody else mm-hmm. off hauling it along this terrible bumpy dusty road yes but uh, he, i i love that he he described his novel as a egalitarian utopia which was not egalitarian at all <laughs> <laughs> like a general in charge everybody <laughs> that's always the way it is <laughs> well, a society that we're all equals except for the rulers mm-hmm. exactly <laughs> everybody but- else is equal. and of course i'm going to be one of the rulers <laughs> because i'm a, a you know a very uh, intelligent and mm. uh, you know what do you call it benevolent yes um, yeah, I have here in my notes, he says, the remedy was strict egalitarianism, uh, but the book's plot was that a man goes to sleep in 1887 and wakes up in 2000 in a society with a leader who is both commander-in-chief and managing director and has the omniscience of a platonic guardian. So mm-hmm. very egalitarian. Uh, but he says, society is not uniform. Uh, it has many different tastes and educations and work. Uh, and the equality is that of purchasing power. And his idea for this equality is that everyone has a card that is annually charged with the same number of credits for everyone, and one can shop at identical stores that do not influence the buyers in any way. He says, uh, the disagreeable manual occupations have few hours, while the agreeable professions have very long hours. And Bellamy called this a form of nationalism rather than socialism. The idea is, you know, uh, because we're all making the same amount, we'll just make people working the, the terrible jobs have the least hours, making people work the, the best jobs have the most hours, which makes sense if you're just looking at it strictly in what is most likable and least likable. But I think it's also the case that a lot of the least likable jobs also have to have the most hours like if, if you're running you know you know a, a sewer system like we were talking about you know uh, a couple episodes ago maybe just last episode you know it's it's pretty often the case that you have to be pretty much on call for that job and you have to work long grueling hours and stuff like that so for anything to run efficiently i don't think you can just make the least likable jobs have the least hours like you just have to be properly compensated i think right because because what you end up with is you'd have to have 10 times as many mm-hmm. people doing the disagreeable jobs then would be doing the agreeable jobs because you're going to, ha- you're only going to make them work a 10th of the time yeah. at those jobs. And so um, that's, that's no good for anybody because yeah. then you're just spreading the misery out of all these other people. Although I, it's, it, it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, a different way to calculate how people should be compensated mm-hmm. with time as opposed to money. Yeah. But what if you wanted to work a double shift in the disagreeable? What if you? What if the disagreeable job was agreeable to you? Mm-hmm. What if you really liked going down the sewers and unplugging it and stuff? Would you get extra credits in his system? No, you could only do it for an hour and a half a week because it's so disagreeable by everybody else's margins. But then you'd be willing to do it forty hours mm-hmm. a week if you can get. And then what's what's to stop people from giving you their credits? Yeah. Because then you could be like, yeah, I'll do this job. And then give me all your, give me half your credits and you don't have to work at all. Mm-hmm. Well, this, this along with the uh, four years idea, and I should have mentioned this earlier. It's like, you know, everything would be so inefficient because with everybody working so few hours, you wouldn't get anything done. You would never really become really good at your job to the point where you're making it efficient. If you're switching right. off people every two hours, nothing is going to work. Well, and as somebody who manages people in a small office, Usually the first 15 minutes are like getting your coffee Mm -hmm. and hello. And there's always a bathroom break on the clock. Mm -hmm. And then, then, you know, you're, you're closing up at the end of your shift for at least the last 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like from the movie office space. Have you ever seen that movie? I have not. Oh, you gotta, you gotta watch the office space where we have to watch it together. Maybe the next time you're in town, because there's there's a guy he's working in the office and and he mentions they have consultants come in. Mm-hmm. to see okay what does everybody do where can we get efficiencies and all that and basically it's a, a prelude to layoffs and they asked this guy who's our hero who was just burned out and, he's, and he explains how he maybe does 15 minutes of work the entire week <laughs> you know <laughs> uh <laughs> of actual work um which is just a really 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 funny movie mm-hmm. you should watch it it's all right so should our listener yes <laughs> but bellamy's utopia Uh, I really like this point, really enraged this guy, William Morris, who wrote News from Nowhere to oppose Bellamy within three weeks. So he read this book and was so mad at it that he wrote an an attack on this book, his own novel, his own utopia in three weeks. Sounds Um, like something I would do. It it absolutely is. Yes. (laughs) A rage. (laughs) Uh, But he was very mad that looking backward, uh, painted a picture of a very privatized middle class world. And so Morris uh, painted a very rural ideal. Uh, the characters in his book walk up the Thames and they observe the ruins of par- Parliament. Barges are propelled by odorless and exhaustless forces. 
and golden jewelry are trinkets. And so the socialist ambition to leapfrog over capitalism and create abundance, again, draws from the backward looking ambition of the good life. Again, just looking, we need to be more rural, do away with all this stuff and things will magically become better. There's not really not much theory there. I just like the point that he was so mad at it that he wrote his own book, which is very funny. <laughs> we then move into Fabianism in the welfare state. And Fabian refers to the Roman general Fabius, who refused to engage in pitched battle with Hannibal until he was uh, weakened. Don't you call him Fabian? I suppose you can. Yeah. If you really want to. Fabian. You say Fabian? I say say Fabian. Um, Well, if you want to pronounce it like the actual Latin, it's it's Fabius. 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 But he didn't want to engage Hannibal, Hannibal until Hannibal was very weakened from fighting outside of his home turf. Um, so the... Hannibal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but the Fabians believed in national efficiency and social justice, drawing on this idea. You are really laughing at yourself right now. Um, he's still laughing. <laughs> Come on, uh, let's get it. We got 10 pages <laughs> left. We do. Uh, but the Fabians kind of dra- uh, drawing on this believed in national efficiency and social justice. Uh, and they were uh, very squarely anti-capitalist and were at odds with the view that whatever the market decides is right. And they wanted people rewarded according to their social usefulness. And the key figures in this were Sidney and Beatrice Webb, uh, who marshaled research on the living conditions of the worst off British people. And um, uh, The natural offspring of their ideas was the welfare state. He says a successful welfare program uh, reduces threats to the legitimacy of a state. Uh, in the sense, you know, everybody knows that they are insured against the hazards of everyday life and so they can live a little bit more easily. But uh, the welfare state may also expose the state to discontent and delegitimation, as when the economy is in trouble and tax revenues are lower, the state insurance may be unable to pay its claims, uh, then just making the people a a lot angrier and a lot more upset than they would have been in the first place. Can you only imagine if our economy crashed and our social safety net, such as it is, couldn't be funded? Do you imagine the chaos that would erupt? Yeah, it would be pretty awful. Yeah. Pretty terrible. Um, Angry, fat people. (laughs) <laughs> that is true um, an army of angry fat people it probably wouldn't be too effective i don't know they got a lot of girth <laughs> they're they're good over short distances that's great dad that's like, that's like a reference of also to, uh, to the lord of the rings lord of the rings yeah, yeah they're where, where there's gimli very, and legolas and gimli i'm very quick under short distances yes yes uh, but he says, which was, which was one of the most frustrating things about that movie, when the three of them, Legolas, uh, Gimli, and Strider, Aragorn, are, Aragorn, are running cross country for leagues. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many miles are in a league, but a long distance. And that little dwarf that they show him every time they show him running, they're like spreading out and leaving him behind. And then then they cut to the next scene, and he's caught up to them, and they start spreading out again. <laughs> That was that was a flat hole. I'm it's very a, sorry. That was that was about uh, that omission. <laughs> um, I think Tolkien was disappointed in that part of the movie. Well, he was long dead by the time it came out. But back to the welfare state. Watching in heaven, don't you think? <laughs> I suppose so. Uh, he says the provision of relief in times of famine or pestilence has always been inescapable in political theory. But what was novel in the late 19th century was the sense that the national governments had a general obligation to ensure the welfare of their citizens from cradle to grave. So the welfare state was vulnerable to the charge that it was uh, you know, extending the state beyond its boundaries. And the response is to argue that modern citizenship exists in more than one dimension. Uh, this idea of, you know, the social dimension of citizenship, you know, you have, you know, generally the, the old form where the state just protects you from foreign attack. But now we have this new dimension. You know, if you're participating, you're providing for other people. You're also very socially part of the, the modern state. He says the welfare state makes no great advance towards socialism. Its egalitarian elements are very minimal. It does not seek to make the poor richer and the rich poorer and does not aim to transform work or working conditions. So that is his his description of the welfare state. Uh, and then yeah, we move and, on. And, and then he, I don't know if you're well, I guess you're going to talk about it a little bit, but he's talking about the the welfare state, and you have to have a certain amount of altruism. Is that what you're getting mm-hmm. to? Yes. Yeah. And, and and there's there there's some truth to that, but it really is a surrendering of moral responsibility for mm-hmm. for somebody else because you say, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to help that person out because there's government benefits for that. 
And, and if you get too much of that, then the whole system breaks down yeah. and, and you have a lot of people who aren't really paying into the system who are, who are just offloading the responsibility to others. And mm-hmm. then before you know it, you have the super wealthy that are paying for everybody's. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's why I disagree with the point. The point he makes there is true in, in some respect in that the welfare system is not put in place to specifically make the rich poorer and the poor richer. But I think right. we are starting to see that that drive more and more and more. Of course, you see the, the slogan tax the rich um, where people are just expecting, well, yeah, we should just take, you know, all of the surplus money from the rich people and give it to the poor people, because why not? They don't need it, which I mean. Or you see like the AOC's dress, eat the rich, eat the rich. Yes. And, and there's not enough rich to eat. That's the problem. <laughs> That you is eat true. The poor. You eat the poor. That's mm. what. But anyway. Yes. Yeah, so well, I still think it's ironic that she she wore that dress to to what was it a, a red carpet or something where it was like you know several thousand dollars for a table. Um, oh, it was Met Gala. Then the yeah. dress probably cost twenty grand. I mean, probably. the tickets were like ten grand or something. Yeah. yeah. Yes, but then we move into humanist Marxism and the rediscovery of civil society. It says welfare is imposes two questions. The first is whether the welfare state has taken the politics out of politics. The second is whether new forms of political association might revive the political life or reinvigorate communal life. And the questions coincide on the idea of civil society. Since Marx initially envisioned that the state would be absorbed by civil society so that social and economic relationships would be self-governing, but this proved false in the Soviet Union very clearly. Uh, But then you have this kind of resurgence in the 1960s, uh, the sense that uh, things drive men became very prominent. Uh, and that we need to denounce the system that we are governed by. And the chief thinker of this was Herbert Marcuse. Um, he imagined an alliance of students, intellectuals, ethnic minorities, and third world revolutionaries uh, to lead us to transcendence. So more just utopian, you know, if we all agree, if we all have this great, you know, socialist revolution, we'll all just lead everybody to transcendence. Uh, but there were two things uh, that he mentions here that really ensured that the socialist dream would always remain a dream. The first was the implosion of the Soviet bloc. Uh, It says attempts to build socialism with a human face were crushed by Soviet tanks in 1956 and 1968. So if you really wanted to make socialism look good, um, you could really just kind of point to the Soviet Union and say, yeah, no, they're a terrible, you know, dictatorship, you know, horrible state there. Um, And any regime that depended on the USSR for legitimacy then crumbled after the Soviet Union crumbled. Uh, But interestingly, the Soviet Union did not immediately leap into pluralist democracy. Again, kind of getting back to that point that, you know, there is still some, you know, underlying human connections aside from government. So, you know, kind of arguing there about the system of government over the top of the it was, people. It was really a PR nightmare. Really? Yeah. Is that, for, is that the point you're making here? For those those communists. Yeah. You know, the Soviet Union was a mm-hmm. really bad public relations issue for those mm-hmm. people. And, and, and he mentions that, you know, it, it's, it really became a kleptocracy. Yeah. That's what all socialist mm-hmm. countries become. Yeah, because it's... You know, you couldn't even argue that socialism was peaceful and communal and everybody was living, you know, nice and happy because you had Stalin. And then you couldn't even argue that socialism was efficient and would last forever because then the Soviet Union just completely dissolved pretty much of its own accord. Um, you know, I mean, arguments could be made about influences with, with you know, outside stuff. But I think it's really sort of a, a di- dissolving from within over many decades for a long time. Well, it just collapsed under its own corruption. Yeah. Really didn't sustain itself. And this is true. Exactly. And then the second reason that ensured that the socialist dream would remain a dream was that most of what socialists wanted could be achieved in a capitalist framework. But believe it or not, um, he says there are new forms of occupational freedom that emerged in the 20th century. Uh, He says ideas began to count more than industrial organization and the hankering for the travail attractif, the work that is indistinguishable from play, can be met within capitalism. Uh, He says, you know, this unproductive labor, you know, the term that Marx uses, you know, the, the stuff that is not just, you know, manual labor to physically create a product now plays arguably a bigger role in our society, uh, is what Alan Ryan claims, uh, you know, not the toiling labor that Marx envisioned, because Marx, Marx envisioned, you know, it'll always be the lower classes just, you know, working away in the fields or the mines or the, the factories, and that's the foundation of society. But now the foundation of society is, is more so office work. Um, you know, of course, we still have all of the manual laborers and things like that, but it's not, you know, they're not the, the, the bedrock of all of society necessarily. Well, I guess they're still very necessary, but it's not, you know, the only thing in our, in our economy. Yeah, you know, when you're talking about like the work is play, uh, mm-hmm. reminded me of these these day in the life of videos that you see on social media mm-hmm. from these idiot, usually women who <laughs> are like my day in the life as a Twitter programmer, and it's like it's nothing but like lunch breaks and play, you know, literally play, mm-hmm. like, foosball. What the hell? <laughs> no wonder he can fire 
75 percent of you and nobody even notices <laughs> we're not doing anything <laughs> same thing over at google they just laid off a bunch of people they're yeah. all the, oh, anyway so yes but they they were living work as play or play as work yes very true uh, oh, wow. but, but then he says we must end this chapter on a cautious note he says humans are very historical and are moved by reminiscence as much as hope for a better future so there is always this this drawback to going back to these socialist ideals i'm going to read here from the quote uh, from the book he says still one set of socialist aspirations has run its course the belief that public ownership of the means of production and distribution was indispensable to prosperity and the first step towards making the marketplace or the workplace humane and interesting is no longer tenable this does not mean that capitalism in its present day european chinese or american form constitu constitutes the end of history we should hope devoutly that it does not and that is how he ends this chapter the next chapter we'll be looking at marxism fascism and dictatorship um, mm -hmm. So another fun one, looking at some some really uplifting topics there. Uh, but yeah, that was, you know, we, we we didn't really talk too much about um, the capitalist welfare state mm -hmm. as much, um, and and, the, and and he made had a lot of a pretty interesting discussion of that, where that you know where, where's where's the line between the welfare state and socialism, mm -hmm. and, and you know socialism as a political theory is not is not amenable to this um, capitalist economy funded welfare state mm -hmm. because, because socialism is like, is all about the power and who owns it as yeah. opposed to delivering the goods for the working class. You know, it, it, and it's, that's the, the big fault of this, the socialist intellectuals is that it's it just like, um, well, I think who, who coined the phrase that they, they love humanity, but they hate humans. Hmm. And there's a lot of truth to that, because if you really wanted to benefit the working class, you'd want to really um, shore up the capitalist system, hmm. get that safety net and really push up wages. Like, you know, it's like if you really care about the working poor in America, why on earth are you not closing the southern border? Yeah. You're bringing in now millions of illiterate peasants, basically, to undercut the wages for the working class. Yeah. And that's what resonates with you know like a lot of minorities with trump uh, mm -hmm. or with other conservative populist republicans because we're like man you're just these people are just undercutting your wages and benefits by flooding the labor market with mm -hmm. labor, and it drives yeah. down the, the, the anyway so so but but the my point going back to my point is is you know it used to be thought of as the welfare system is just a road to socialism but I think the wealth, uh, and it can be, but it, uh, I'm coming around to the thought that the welfare system is just the is just the road to welfare system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it doesn't have to go, it doesn't have to cause the political change in the capitalist system or in the government. You can mm -hmm. just have these additional benefits as long as you can afford them. Yeah, I'm worried because so many people have become dependent on them and mm -hmm. our economy has become dependent on the government spending. Mm -hmm. What happens when it stops yeah well because there's there's only you can only you know i think put in more programs i don't think we've gotten to this point i don't think we can ever you know cut back on all of the welfare programs really very easily because i mean there's there's been talks forever about essentially ending social security and stuff like that and it's, well you know what do you do with the money of all the people that have already you know spent all of this money on on social security by having it taken out of their paychecks and stuff like that you know who gets the last little bit of social security and stuff like that. So it's like, once you go there, it's very hard to go back, which I, I think is one of the biggest issues. I have news for you. All that money is gone. <laughs> I'm not kidding. There, there is no money left yeah. of the money that I put in. It is not there. It yeah. has been, uh, we have $31 trillion in debt. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no social security lockbox, which yeah. is a reference to Al Gore's campaign. I'm going to put social security in a lockbox. What the hell is a lockbox? Uh, well, yeah, that, that, that's the issue I'm talking about is because, you know, you've already spent all this money and now you're not going to receive it if the future generations don't spend their money on you. So if we stop Social Security, you've already spent all the money, but you're not going to get any of the benefits. So it's almost impossible to, to undo it in a fair way. Well, it's just going to be undone by a crisis. Yeah, it, it's either going to keep going. I mean, it's just like um, Victor Davis Hanson likes to say it, it's good. I don't know if he's quoting somebody else. Uh, what cannot go? What cannot continue will not continue. Mm -hmm. And and our spending cannot continue at this rate, and so it's 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 a real concern for our society if 
it all hits the fan because so many of us are dependent upon this, these government programs, mm -hmm. uh, government spending. I mean, even my practice, we, we represent a bunch of public entities. What happens if, if there's an economic collapse and, and all that? And, and then what happens if all our clients lose their jobs? Well, you know, there's, it's, there's a ripple effect. And, and that safety net is, there is an important safety net. I think we all pretty much agree there has to be some sort of safety net for those people that cannot help themselves through mm -hmm. whatever reasons, even, even if they're able-bodied people, if there's a layoff, but then the question is how much and for how long, but um, you know, if, 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 um, if there's some, well, if there, well, there's, let's put it this way. If there's war between China and the United States, we're screwed because our economy is so dependent on that trade Mm -hmm. If that gets shut off, we're going to be screwed. They're going to be screwed. And the whole, it's like a house of cards is going to get yeah. called in. And we're not going to, there's not going to be any money to issue checks for social security. There's not going to be any money for these, um, what do they call the uh, uh, earned income tax credit, which is just a payoff mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's a welfare through the tax code. Uh, the, the, you know, conservatives got rid of direct welfare payments, but this is just an indirect welfare payment system. Um, and so, so that's a problem mm -hmm. and, and and we can't maintain it at the current level yeah our spending is not we can't keep doing this at our, at our current level and so mm -hmm. how do we how do we deal with that yeah. do we, well i think it's also an also an issue you know what you were talking about you know it's important to have you know the frameworks for people who cannot work mm -hmm. but there's just so many people who, who do not work as well as watching this clip earlier you know it was uh it was um uh payment i'm, I'm the, the word slipping my mind um payment for for a child uh in a divorced couple um, oh yeah the, the child support child support yeah there we go i don't know why i was, I was struggling with the words um yeah, which is slightly different from yeah. yeah just supporting the child yeah child support um but it's, it's it's slightly different than a you know a universal welfare system and stuff like that but um the judge was talking to these two people the guy you know pays all the life insurance he works out all day and he's the one paying all the life insurance um and so the judge asked the woman you know well what do you do what do you do uh, do you work and he, she goes well no i'm a stay-at-home mom i take care of the child and he says well the child's in school for eight hours a day right she says, well, yeah. She says, well, what do you do all day? Do you work during that time? She says, no. Well, why not? I don't mm -hmm. want to. She, she just flat out said, I do not want to. I don't want to work. And she says, well, can you work? She says, yeah, I could, but I don't want to. I was like, well, he's paying for everything. Why should I? And, and that, that was literally what she straight up just told the judge. You know, didn't make any excuses for it. Just, I do not want to work. You're acting like that's news. I guess it's I mean, news. <laughs> I mean, it's just so it, it, baffling to me. Like, even if you were, you know, even if that was true, I don't know why you wouldn't just like make some excuse for yourself um, in front of the judge. And so just saying, yeah, I don't work. I don't you're, want to. You're making an argument uh, against marriage and children. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, that, that happens in courtrooms yeah. uh, all across the United States. Uh, yeah. and, but, but that's an example of, that's not a welfare system. That's an, in, it's an individual transfer of wealth mm -hmm. from a person to another. Yeah. But I mean, I think I think a lot of the same philosophy applies to a lot of the people who are on welfare. I'm not saying, you know, everybody on welfare, you know, shouldn't have welfare. But I think there are a lot of people who are like, well, I could just sit at home and, you know, I, I got I got injured, you know, 20 years ago. I hurt my leg and I got laid off for it. Now I can just sit here and I can collect checks from the government and I don't have to do anything. Yeah, that's called Social Security disability. Yeah, and that's it's rampant. And and what you're really looking at is a freeloader problem. Mm hmm all social service programs. And, and, and the question is, and, and if you have a society that, that it goes back to my earlier point, our society doesn't judge people and doesn't shame people for their, their disruptive and, and despicable behavior. Um, there are so many people that are on permanent disability and getting disability payments instead of working now that are not disabled. It is astounding. Um, mm -hmm. And the amount of money that we're, we're spending on that, it, it really undermines the disability system for those people that can't, can't work. And, the, and the, by the same token, you'll see people who are legally blind that that are going to work. There, there was a guy that finally had to, to retire as a court clerk a couple of years ago because he had some sort of, um, I don't know, it was multiple sclerosis or something. But he had like those, you know, those not, not crutches, but those arm crutches. Mm -hmm. and, and he had a really hard time walking at all. But he yeah. came to work, he wanted to work. And so mm -hmm. he could have absolutely been on full disability and all that stuff, but he wanted to work. And so you have those people. Uh, that you know, you almost have to force them to not work, uh, and then you have the freeloader problem. Yeah. And the freeloader 
control problem has gotten out of control because there's the, the family and friends of the freeloaders aren't saying, why don't you get off your fat butt and go to work instead of having me and every, all these other taxpayers pay you. Instead, they convince their friends, hey, why are you working? You're a fool. You should just get on this thing and see yeah. this doctor and, and say you, you have all these mental problems and you're on, a, you're on a disability for mental health issues. Those mm-hmm. are the worst. Yes. Well, with that sobering <laughs> note, uh, do we have any other final thoughts on socialisms or the, the welfare state? Uh, no, I think I've said enough. Yeah, I think yeah, I think we had some good rants. We had some good thoughts there. You can, of course, follow us on Twitter at ULMTD Opinions. Get updates on when uh, new episodes are out and things like that. But this has been Season 4, Episode 25 of Unlimited Opinions. I've been Adam Bishop. I'm still Mark Bishop. The one, the one and only. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Hey! <laughs> I'm cloning myself. Oh, no. We need at least three of me. Uh, oh, I, I don't know about that.